Philosophy. Question. Enlightenment. Deep conversation. Spirituality. This is the spiritual download. Yeah, because in physics they say that um, the physical world or the world that's made up of atoms is only 4% of what we understand of the mm -hmm. universe. So there's also dark energy and dark matter. Now my question is, if you are, understand how, um, how you connect to your consciousness and what it is, are you able to become a little bit more um, conscious of what these other types of uh, le levels in the universe are, like what dark energy could possibly be? There certainly seems to be in my conscience, you know, there, there's, you know, I don't know much about physics, but I hear terms like string theory and dark matter, and they're talking about different kinds of dark matter now and then they don't know what it is dark holes light holes they have all kinds of, you know all kinds of uh, names for what's going on in physics these terms that the physicists use sound very much like the mechanics of seeing how the universe is connected to say my consciousness you know i see strings and light and energy and there's all kinds of Explosions and explosions of consciousness that appear to look like the universe is coming and going, and there's there's just an infinite number of strings connecting uh, my consciousness to my environment, and the environment to the cosmic events and cosmic events to universal events. And yes, I think I think physics will eventually start realizing that. They're going to have to get out of calling these things physical events. They're going to have to call them consciousness events. And that's taking a while. But there's, you know, they're taking their time coming around to that one. But I don't think there's any answer to the whole show other than in consciousness. Ultimately, they're going to have to come to the conclusion that the only way to study these things is start putting names on. Consciousness and what, what it looks like, how it actually functions, and these dark holes and black holes and, and string theory and all of these will stop being theories and will start being descriptions of enlightenment, self-realization. I think that's what physicists are trying to. They wouldn't agree with me, but that's what they're trying to explore and and describe. I think the great physicists all knew that their intuition was uh, part of the realization process. But... So um, you have a close, you had a close relationship with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, or um, what was uh, his understanding of connecting the spiritual practice with uh, modern science and where modern science could um, benefit spirituality and then spirituality could possibly benefit science what uh, what was his viewpoint or what was his big objective in that realm well marishi um advocated that if enough people are meditating in the world then it'll create an effect in the world and he called it the one percent effect so one percent of a society or one percent of the world was meditating, it would have a, a, a very unifying effect on the world. And that's why he uh, started uh, a movement in 20, 30 different countries to get groups of people meditating. And in terms of the individual, he gave us techniques that, um, and to put it in Vedic terms, you know, basically what I talk about, you know, isn't very, isn't very different if it's different at all from what Maharishi was advocating only I'm not talking Vedic language, I'm talking in just English normal terms, but you know, just very quickly Maharishi divided, you know, kind of he talked about 
alpha, beta, and the beta has these uh, terms, you know, uh, the tin mondals of the rig grade, for instance, fire, air, water, earth, and so forth. And he said, and basically advocated that these are constituents, not of just a cosmic reality, but individual reality, how these senses function. And he connected it uh, with ancient Vedic knowledge with modern science. And, you know, I don't claim to be able to describe anything about physics. I just have my own experience, you know, and my own experience certainly confirms what Maharishi was teaching and what he was saying, but I don't use his terminology most of the time because that's not how I see, exactly how I see it. I mean, I would say what I say um, confirms his experience, and but I can't put it into Vedic terms like he, but yes, uh, he, had, he had a language that um, he attempted to and succeeded in combining physics. You know, he was actually a physics student when he was a youngster. He went to college and studied physics. And, and he had a scientific bend because I guess that's the age we're in worldwide. So he put most of his knowledge into scientific terms to try to, which was a feat in itself. Could you describe his influence um, in the Western world? Maybe being, I don't know if the, if transcendental, transcendental meditation was one of the first uh, practices that a lot of Americans and Europeans knew about. Would this be in about the 70s? Yes, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, when I started to, um, I think Maharishi, you know, there were other, gurus that came from the East or India, you know, Yogananda, Bishop, a number of them came and they started the process prior to Maharishi, but Maharishi was the first one who had kind of a big world movement and he came up with it with techniques and processes that were extremely simple and were suitable for everybody to practice. And I think many people tried to copy these things to various degrees of success. Um, I mean, I still do TM after all these years because I enjoy it. Um, I have the experience that we were supposed to, and that was obviously advocated we'll get from these techniques. I have those experiences, but it, it, it hasn't taken away the desire to go inside and experience more and more. And yes, I believe Marishi had, a, you know, this, this community that I live in here, this several thousand people doing TM in this little town. And there's thousands of people in various countries around the world, also tens of thousands doing TM, maybe some millions. And, uh, and are there bigger movements? I don't know. But I, I think the TM organization as a whole has taught uh, meditation techniques is very effective and simple that people can learn. And, and I think I have to say that, you know, once you start meditation, there has to be something, not just the initial technique, there has to be advanced techniques that show you, take you all the way, don't stop at the silence thing, but actually take you to unified state of consciousness, the states of consciousness that encompass the whole show. And uh, I think the TM organization does that, has those other organizations. I don't know. That's the one I know. Yeah, I, I wonder with people who are kind of, you know, experts in spirituality, do you think it's a good strategy to use a lot of secular and layman's terms? Um, or do you think it kind of decreases the almost the integrity of the, of the uh, spiritual practice or the philosophy when you almost acquiesce to like, our secular society and use these terms, or do you think it's better to almost like wait and uh, for society to catch up to this, I guess, level of open-mindedness or curiosity towards a spiritual practice or spiritual way of being? 
Um, or do you think maybe it's got to be some sort of a balance there? The, I, you know, there's such a misunderstanding about the South Carolina state. Um, I think it's completely okay to talk about self-realization in very simple Western terms because my experiences and, and the experience I had with people that have woken up is that it's such a simple state that it can be described. It doesn't have to be described in intellectual terms or I believe in divine terms or any other kind of terms other than English. Simple English self-awareness is self-awareness. It, it, it has a quality to it. Anybody who experiences self-realization can describe it like describing their own environment. Um, it's whatever they see, whatever they feel, they can describe it very simply. So I think I think it's okay to discuss it. And I think it's okay without the understanding. You can't have realization. You can have all kinds of inner experience. You can have divine experience. You can have you can even have very clear uh, self-awareness 24 hours a day, but if you don't know what you're experiencing, you don't get the benefit. It's like you've got the you've got the bank account, but you haven't gone into the vault to spend any of the money. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you're in, somebody gave you a billion dollars and you've got the key, but you haven't used it yet. You know you got it, so you're kind of satisfied, but you haven't taken any of the money out and spent it. And in a sense, without understanding that you, the money's in the bank, you only got half the show. So in a sense, you're not really realized. But you do. But when you actually realize that you're woken up, that's why you say, wait a minute, I've always had the key. I've always had this. I've always had the billion dollars. I've always had such a woman. So I think it's, that was a very astute question you're asking is to be taught in layman's terms. I don't think there are layman's terms when it comes to self-realization because self-realization isn't meant for the experts. It isn't meant for the field, PhDs, and the, I think, I mean, it is, but it's not meant just for them. It's meant for everybody, for the guy walking down the street, you know, the garbage collector, the whatever. Anybody doing anything in life is eligible to wake up. So, of course, we should use a layman's terms, in my opinion. What other terms could they understand? What other terms could I understand? I'm an artist. You have to use normal words with me. Before I understood what, uh, what, what I was experiencing, I was only getting part of the show. And in order to describe it to me and for me to understand what I was experiencing, it had to be simple, not complicated. You know, you know, it, it didn't need to be Vedic or philosophical, they need it to be simple and factual and related to what I've actually experienced. So yes, I think you should discuss it and you should discuss it in terms of uh, simple terms and just the way it is, just the kind of experience it is. And then later on, as you, as the self-awareness becomes more full, you can say, using the intellect to look at it more closely and describe it in more detail. And I think that's useful too. After the after the dawning or after the wakefulness is there. Now how how do we get to that point? Um, maybe I'm kind of drilling you as if you were a politician, but how, what are some maybe practical things that we can do? Maybe I mean I'm a school teacher, so how how do we eventually reach that level where maybe we're talking about these ideas in in the classroom? Um, how do we how do we get to that point? You know, the thing for me was prior to meditating, I had all these experiences. I didn't know what they were. I think many, many, many people have experiences. They just don't. Our society doesn't give validity to these kinds of experiences. So you don't talk about them, you don't, uh, you don't make a big deal out of them. But I have, I certainly feel that without 
meditating, it's a long road. It's hard to get through. I think people have to start meditating, whether they do TM or something else. But TM is the only one I know, and I know that it works. Um, if you start TM, then you have a basis of discussion. You have to, this basis of understanding. Oh, I had some silence. What was that? Um, prior to that, I'm, you know, maybe one in a thousand people had, or one in a hundred people had some experience that they could relate to. Um, when they meditate, then almost everybody has something. So I'd say, yes, I think people have to start meditating. Well, you find it ironic that we live in a pretty religious country in the United States, but we don't talk about spiritual topics. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny, isn't it? Um, is it really spiritual to, um, you know, I don't want to get into politics, right? But um, many of the things that are advocated as spiritual are the opposite of spiritual. And we're just saying we're spiritual. We're not actually being spiritual. Spiritual means self-aware. An awake person is self-aware. He has the basis of religion. He has the basis of eventually meeting God or the Creator or the Goddess or whatever. Um, do you honestly feel that any of these so-called spiritual leaders are actually spiritual? I'm not sure. I'll leave that up to what they do and what they know. Yeah, it, it is hard to, hard to tell. I think one of the main things is the, the advantages of being a meditator yourself is that you're able to almost read the nonverbal communications of other people and you kind of get a sense of their character without, um, without just kind of being mired in their words, right? Because oftentimes politicians who are good orators, they might sound good when they're speaking, but you know, what, what does their behavior and their nonverbal communication reflect? And I think being kind of open-minded first and then second, um, being kind of in touch with that nonverbal way of being, um, that's how you get to know not just politicians, but people in your life. Um, and I think that leads to almost more fruitful relationships because you can say, oh, I know that intuitively, I know that this person is a good person. I want to spend more time with them. Now, this person I thought was, but no, their actions don't really, really reflect what they say. Um, I don't know if you've had experiences like that throughout your life as you meditated more and more you kind of got more intuitive as you got um, more mature yes that's certainly true and you know when i was a youngster you know my parents belonged to the lutheran religion and you know they took me to the lutheran church and you know it was all great but you know, it didn't take me long to figure out these guys didn't know what they were talking about. They drank a little bit too much and whatever, you know. So uh, you got the feeling it was just something that, you know, get a gathering together every Sunday, trying to learn the scriptures, but there was no, at least in, in my case, I got the feeling that there was no true understanding of what the spirituality was. And <clears throat> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going after what's in the Bible. It's fine. There's no problem. It's a great book. And uh, Jesus was a great saint. And I don't have any problem with that. Um, but just because you go to church on Sunday doesn't mean you're spiritual. <laughs> Most people just go, you know, solve your sins and then go do your stuff for the rest of the week. And so, I'm sure it's more than that for some people, but for many people, that's all it is. And going into the self with some meditation process, you could face to face with who you really are and your spirituality status and what it's all about. And all these, um, you get the possibility of meeting the creator and all that kind of stuff. And Use, you know, when you use, when I use words like infinite and eternal, 
those are in the realm of spirituality. You know, those are qualities of spirituality, qualities of fullness that, ex that exist in the human heart. And all we have to do is go inside and discover them. But if we don't go inside, then you know, we'll just live our life, you know, doing our changing things. Then you get to do it again and again. That's all. Right? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and and we, we've been talking for quite a while. I'm wondering if there were any other passages that you really wanted to um, to read from your book. So the title of this chapter, here again, The uh, Landscape of Enlightenment. It's both an email book and uh, hard copy on Amazon. However, the title is, Why Are the Details of Self-Awareness Important? However simple and expanded one's consciousness might be, a fuller, more conscious understanding of the spiritual, personal, and physical implications of these experiences will only add richness, delight, and stability. Deep understanding also makes it possible to share experience in a meaningful and believable way with others. I have over time experienced more and more silence, absolute stillness, and immovable unboundedness in both meditation and activity. However, along with this almost transcendental experience of a background field of knowingness, there has always been a corresponding clarity in the relationship of this inner silence with outer activity. What do I mean by knowingness? When, within the experience of pure silence, there was enough subtlety subtlety of awareness that the experience was not only silent, but, but could also be heard as the primary configuration of preformed intelligence, then I could know and see the relationship between pure intelligence and physical life. The basic value of knowing this is pure intelligence. On a very quiet level of this reverberating intelligence, it's experienced that preforms preform sound that is the very knowledge and basis of all divine and physical forms or physical life. This experience is not what we normally associate with the surface value of sound, but rather it is the universal resonance or hum of creation that can be heard. I knew that I was hearing and seeing the ground state of consciousness from which physical matter arises. This whole description is really just an elaborated description of everyone's subtle consciousness. So this is a, one more chapter I'm going to read. Chapter 76, the complete uninvolved nature of complete involvement. You know, there's always that, that uh, there's always this stillness that you, you wonder how, how it can possibly be. Experience everything and still be the silent state. I don't remember what I wrote here, but hopefully I answered that question. I must say that there is an aspect of my awareness that remains so still that there's absolutely no involvement of inner pure wing awareness with anything else whatsoever. Yet, I am also so absolutely involved in all aspects of my experience that this inner silence and my mental and physical activity have permeated each other without any loss to either. This lively cooperation has been reconciled over the years. I have recognized this as the eternal play of absolute silence in relation, in relation to absolute activity. It is the story of my and everyone's existence. Even though the all-pervading, expanded nature of conscious, consciousness permeates and structures my awareness, and is the wonderful, wonderful content of every aspect of my life. It still served to greatly increase in every possible way my thirst, my thirst for even more knowledge, more expansion, more life. I know without a doubt that I have made it. So what? I still want more. <laughs> there has never been a decrease in my de desires, and since these desires never hide the suffering or experience, they are naturally grander, more free, roaming increasingly directed towards helping others. I, I guess you could even say that my personal desires and the universal desires are experienced as the same impulse. 
I have always considered my inner experience very personal, not really anybody's business but my own. That is why I have taken so many years before starting to openly talk and write about it. I always felt that it would be like inviting random strangers into my home. So what changed? As my experience and understanding broadened and became more universal, the feeling that there are strangers in the world disappeared, particularly when the subtlest regions of my heart and mind became visible. I saw how we all connected and mostly just working out the best possible outcome for our time here on Earth. In other words, the increased clarity of awareness came from increased compassion and the natural desire to share. You know, you wonder, you know, so what do you, what do, you do when you, after you realize this now, what is it you want to do? What's more? In many systems of self-development, they consider you get to this field of silence, life is over, that's it. You don't need anything else. You got a little bit of bliss, you got a little bit of love. It's unbounded, non-connectedness with your life in general. Um, so what else do you need? You got, you got everything. That certainly was never my experience. My experience was that, you know, once I had self-awareness, yes, there was an initial period of a little bit of separation from uh, life in general. You know, this silence became there and it was a little uh, luring for a little while. And then, and then, uh, and then the silence became more, got more and more lively, more and more interesting. And I started to think about what's going on here. It's the silence of the center of stillness. How is it connected to the living? How is it connected to my outer life? How is it connected to the life in general? How is it connected to the people? How is it connected to the society, the world, the universe? So, so I started asking myself, the more I asked myself, the more inner to outer experience I started having, I began to realize that uh, silence is one aspect of the realization. Um, and everything else in the universe is another aspect. And it all works together uh, to create a totality that is true realization, true unity, consciousness, true uh, 